Um, <clears throat> I'm delighted to, uh, to welcome Nessa Carey. Uh, Nessa, as you will have seen, is a distinguished scientist. She's a uh, visiting professor at Imperial <coughs> College, uh, but she's also done a load of real jobs. She's worked in industry, she's worked in the public service, uh, and most recently <coughs> she's been very involved with the translation of science and uh, getting people like us to be able to understand what's going on uh, and written books and so on. We're delighted to have her here. She's very CSAR-ish. I bet you didn't know that when you came. I did not. No, very csr -ish. It's a very great honor, of course. Um, and uh, not wishing to personalize this, but uh, I'm sure my kids would like to know what this is about so they can do something about the dodgy DNA they inherited from me. Their mother's <laughs> perfect, but mine's a bit iffy. Nessa, please. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is this working? Yes. Fabulous. Um, can I get the lights turned up slightly? Turned okay? up, yes, by all means. Thank you very much. So, absolutely delighted to be here today. Um, it's great pleasure to talk to such a varied audience, and it's great to talk about epigenetics in Cambridge, because Cambridge is one of the real powerhouses in this field. And epigenetics is absolutely my favorite topic, not just because this is what I did a lot of research on in industry, but because it's just intrinsically very cool. It's a fascinating, weird field. It's very controversial. It's very argumentative. And so I like fields like that. So that's what we're going to talk about. Let's see if this is working. Oh, no, that's not working. That doesn't work. Right. That's all right. I'll just, I, I can, I can yeah. go old fashioned. Not a problem. <laughs> I can't talk about epigenetics without talking about genetics. Um, and back in 2001, the first human genome sequence was released. And there was this huge, huge press conference, and people said very silly things. So um, President Clinton said, today we are learning the language in which God created life. I always thought somebody should have said to Bill, Actually, it's a room full of scientists. God may not be the way to go. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, and Michael Dexter, who was chair of the Wellcome Trust, described this as the outstanding achievement in human history, which again, I think, is pushing it a bit. But they actually had to say really, really big things about it because we'd made them spend so much money on it. <laughs> we said, Honestly, for two billion dollars, a mere two billion dollars, you could find out everything. And they went, okay. And they, they copped up two billion dollars. Um, now, you can get your genome sequence for about a thousand dollars, because the price has come down spectacularly. But the reality is, every scientist knew that the human genome sequence was not going to provide the answer. The human genome sequence was a superb infrastructure sequence infrastructure project. It's created loads and loads of other things that we can do. But genetics, on the whole, cannot be the answer. It just can't. Sometimes it is. Sometimes you can have a mutation that has a devastating effect. DNA is an alphabet, just four letters, but we have a vast number of letters. So you inherit 3,000 million of those letters called base pairs from your mother and 3,000 million from your father. And sometimes all it needs is one of those to be wrong and you can have a devastating disorder. One in three billion and you can have a child who, for example, by the age of 10 has the physical body of a 90-year-old. So sometimes genetics plays a huge role and it can't be everything. And we always knew it couldn't be everything. And the reason is because we've always known about these epigenetic phenomena. Epi comes from the Greek, and it just means at, on, in addition to, as well as. And all it meant was there are lots of situations where two things, like the same genetics, the same DNA sequence, they're not the same as each other. So something else must be happening in addition to the DNA script. One of the best examples of this that we knew about since about the 1920s was about laboratory mice. So you can create laboratory mice which are genetically absolutely identical to each other. Um, it doesn't require any fancy gene editing or anything like that. You just inbreed them 
more and more and more and more and more, <coughs> and eventually they will be genetically identical. And you can keep them under identical laboratory conditions, and they won't be the same as each other. <coughs> Even though you have control of <coughs> genetics and their environment, they will differ in things like body weight. This was shown over and over again. It was so well established that it was given a name. This phenomenon was referred to as intangible variation. I love that. Because basically, what we did was took something we didn't understand at all and give it a really fancy sounding name. <laughs> Where I went, oh great. Yeah. And if any student ever said anything like, I, I don't understand why these mice are so different from each other, somebody would go, oh, it's an example of intangible variation. <laughs> Superb! No idea what it meant. We do this a lot of time. <laughs> um, if you look at a maggot and a fly, and sadly I'm the kind of geek who does this a lot, not even professionally, just for fun. I spend, my, spend quite a lot of time doing this. A maggot looks completely different from an adult fly. Maggots, squidgy little things, vestigial legs, not much going on. Flies, beautifully complex creatures. But they have exactly the same DNA as each other. They have to. <coughs> When a maggot pupates and turns into an adult fly, there is no genome fairy who comes along and gives it a whole new set of genes. It's using exactly the same DNA, yet they're totally different. Um, crocodiles. If I were to take DNA from this lady here and this gentleman here, you can see why I needed the lights up. Um, I once did this in a dark lecture theatre and got it wrong, it was really embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> and I sequence the DNA, I would be able to tell you which came from this lady and which from this gentleman. Because you would have two X chromosomes, and you would have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. In mammals, gender is determined genetically. Males have a Y chromosome. Crocodiles. <coughs> If I were to take DNA rather more carefully from a male crocodile and a female crocodile and sequence them, I could not tell you which DNA came from the male and which from the female. Because gender in crocodiles is not determined by genetics. Does anyone remember what it is? Temperature. Temperature. It's the temperature at which the eggs develop. These are great examples of epigenetic phenomena where you can't explain the phenotype through because. You can't explain the phenotype by the genetics, but there is one example which is even better. <coughs> and in fact, there's about, I don't know, 100 examples of it in this room this evening. And that is because, whoop, sorry, every single person in this room is a masterpiece of epigenetics. It's really strange, you know, <coughs> excuse me, no matter how old we are, we do not want to think about the fact that we were created because our mother and father had sex. <laughs> <coughs> I really don't want to think about it. Um, a sperm fused with an egg. And together they made one cell. And that cell divided to form two, which divided to form four, which divided to form eight, sixteen, on and on and on. Till you get to the 70 trillion or so cells that make up your body unimaginably big number, <coughs> with the exception of a tiny percentage of cells in the immune system. All the cells in your body have exactly the same DNA script. There is nothing different about the DNA in your liver compared with your kidneys, or in your bone compared with your heart. Those cells are completely different from each other. And they know to remain completely different from each other. They do not start morphing into different cell types. You never get teeth in your eyeballs. <laughs> when I was writing my first book, The Epigenetics Revolution, I wanted to call it No Teeth in Your Eyeballs. <laughs> and my publisher said, and I quote, it lacks a certain gravitas. <laughs> um, so we're in this really strange position. All the DNA, all the cells in our body, pretty much, have exactly the same DNA, but are spectacularly different to each other. So how can that be? Well, one thing that we have to do is we have to stop thinking about DNA as being like a mold or a template. It's not. DNA is like a script, okay? 
And that's how, using one set of DNA instructions, one genome, we can get different instructions. We can have different cell types and we can have a maggot to the fly. If you think of it like a script. Now, what I have there are stills from two movies. Both of them used the same Shakespeare script. Which one was it? Romeo and Juliet. Excellent. <clears throat> Does anybody know who the ones in black and white were? No? Don't worry, even University of the Third Age got this one wrong as well. Um, it's Leslie Howard and Moira Shearer back in the 1930s. How about the one in colour? Who's in that? I love it. It absolutely doesn't matter what age group I ask or what gender distribution I say. Who are the ones in colour? And you hear Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loves Leo. Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes. Now, both movies use the same script, but they are totally different productions of Romeo and Juliet. And any of you who have ever acted in the theatre, um, either through a love of <coughs> dramatics or because you were applying for university and your teachers said, take part in the school play, you'll look like a more balanced <coughs> person. <laughs> did that, you might have had the read-throughs where you go through the script together and it's like, oh, let's, let's put a pencil through that line. Oh, stick a post-it note on there reminding you to exit at that point or whatever. Stage directions. You know, all those little things that we do that change the way the production appears that didn't ever change Shakespeare's script. Not really. It was all still there. That's what DNA is like. Which is great. <coughs> But there's a bit of a problem. Another movie. Which movie is this? Time Machine. Time Machine, excellent. Okay, for the younger people in the audience, <laughs> which um, American sitcom was the Time Machine featured in? <gasps> That's a big, bang. big Bang Theory. Excellent, good, good, good. There was a fabulous moment in this 1960s production of the Time Machine when the time traveller, it's before he's actually built his time machine, and he's built a model of it. And he goes to meet his Edwardian, because that's what it's said, fellow scientists. And he says to them, I'm going to make a time machine. And he shows them the model. And they say, <coughs> excuse me, they say, time machine? How's that going to work? And he says, well, the time traveler will sit in that chair. And if he wants to move into the future, he'll push that lever forwards. And if he wants to travel into the past, he'll pull that lever backwards. And they'll go, oh, as if he's explained it. <laughs> of course, he hasn't explained it. All he's done is describe it. And so far, all I've done is describe epigenetics. I've not really done much more than coming up with my own version of intangible variation. The thing that makes epigenetics so exciting <clears throat> at the moment is the fact that we don't just have descriptions now. We have explanations. We are starting to understand at the level of individual bits of DNA how you can take the same DNA sequence as a cell or an organism and get different outcomes. <coughs> and it's all down to this. Now this is a model of what DNA looks like in your cells, though it's not coloured. <laughs> DNA, we tend to think of it when it's drawn as this long stringy molecule. But it can't really be exactly like that. For a start it would be very difficult to fit it into the nucleus. We have about two meters of DNA in each cell in our body, and the nucleus is only about a thousandth of a millimeter across. <clears throat> so DNA is very highly structured. So, I will, no, I will not jump up to try and show you. That's ridiculous. <laughs> even up, even my spatial <laughs> memory shows me I can't reach really up there. <clears throat> the curvy bits around the outside, that's the DNA, the famous double helix. And it is wrapped around eight proteins called histone <coughs> proteins. Now those proteins are shaped like a fist, they're globular proteins, but each one, you can see, has a tail sticking out. You see the way like on the right hand side there's this yellow bit sticking out down the bottom and a green bit sticking up out there. Well that's where the histone proteins send out a bit that protrudes past the DNA. Basically you get 147 base pairs of DNA, 147 letters wrapped around histone proteins, then the DNA carries on a bit, then another, wrapped around another 100, sorry, 147 base pairs wrapped around eight more histone proteins, and on, 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 on. 
So in our cells, there are millions of those structures. This work, which uses the same sort of structural work that we heard about so beautifully a few minutes ago, this was beautiful, beautiful structural biology. But from my point of view, <coughs> as somebody who tries to communicate about science, that image is a little bit unhelpful. If you're not used to pictures like this, it's a little overwhelming. It's, you know, I actually see people recoil from it. It was also extraordinarily expensive to create the data that led to this image. And, most critically for me, I can't modify the image to show you things I want to show you. So I decided, with a marvelous degree of confidence, I would build my own model of what DNA really looks like in the cell. And, you know, I try to be modest, but I feel mine has certain advantages. Um, it did not cost millions of dollars to create. Um, it was very easy for me to adapt it and to photograph it and show you things I wanted to show you. And then once I'd done that, I ate it, which I feel was a huge advantage. <laughs> um, because mine is made from strawberry laces, marshmallows, and jelly tots. <laughs> now, I always say, you should really know what your most serious take-home message is in any talk of mine is, do try jelly tots again, they're really nice. <laughs> um, this model always goes down the storm. The only time it didn't was when I started it and then thought, oh, God almighty, I'm at a dental conference. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, not my finest hour. Anyway, strawberry laces represent the DNA. I have not tried to make double-stranded strawberry laces. I'm not that technically adept. But here we are. Marshmallows represent those histone proteins, the ones I told you about. Eight of them in a cluster. And the cocktail sticks cunningly represent those tails that I told you stick out. Now, DNA <coughs> is wrapped around the histone proteins. So you get DNA wrapped around the histone proteins, carries on a bit, wrapped around another cluster of histone proteins. I was going to do three clusters, but, I, clusters, but I'd already eaten some of the marshmallows. So <laughs> now, to explain what happens, is anyone here a teacher or an ex-teacher? Oh, you're so going to be able to understand this. Right, good. Let's imagine we're getting to, we're about halfway through the summer term. And despite the fact that no doubt your students were all complete darlings, you get home of an evening occasionally and think, oh Lord, I could do with a little gin to take the edge off. <laughs> term continues. And you're about two weeks from the end of term, end of term, and you're still going home at night thinking, oh God, I need a little gin to take the edge off. Only now. You need two gins, or three gins, to take the edge off. Because your body has adapted. Here's what's happening. Alcohol is coming into your system. Signaling cascades are set up, and the liver needs to produce more of the enzyme that breaks down alcohol. And it does. This is why your tolerance for alcohol goes up very quickly, is that the more you drink up to a certain limit, over a prolonged period, the more the body adapts to be able to break the alcohol down. What happens is that that bit of strawberry lace is the gene that codes for the enzyme that breaks down alcohol. Signals are sent to that region of the genome, and tiny chemical modifications are added onto the tails of those histone proteins. And I've shown them by the green jelly tots. And what those basically do is they make it easier for the cell to switch on that gene. And so ultimately you get more of the protein that breaks down alcohol, and that's why you need to drink more gin to get the same buzz. Let's say it's now two weeks into the summer holidays, and you wake up one morning and you think, I really, really shouldn't drink so much gin. I've heard it's not good for me. And you stop drinking the gin, because you're not teaching at the moment. Signaling cascades again are set up. Now there is no point your liver to continuing to produce large amounts of the enzyme to break down alcohol if there's no alcohol coming into your body. Those modifications represented by the green jelly tops are removed. And different modifications represented by my personal favorites, the purple jelly tops, get added. And what these do is they signal that this gene really doesn't need to be switched on very much. So what we have here is a way of controlling the volume of gene expression. Genes can be switched on a lot or not 
very much at all, depending on the histone modifications. If those repressive histone modifications, the ones that say don't switch this gene on much, are there in high quantities or for a long time, they will attract other enzymes which come and put modifications directly on the DNA itself. Yellow genitals. These say, no really, this gene doesn't need to be switched on. And there are some parts of our genome where you get a huge amount of that kind of modification. Really, really high levels of that direct modification to the DNA. When that happens, the entire region of DNA becomes distorted. It gets completely compacted, and the genes can never be switched on. So what we have are a set of modifications that can act as on-off switches, because this is acting as an off switch, but also can act as volume switches. So we have enormous flexibility. The ones on the histones that I told you about, those are really controlling levels of gene expression. So those are acting as a way of controlling our genes' response to the environment. They are the bridge between nature and nurture. Mm -hmm. The ones that shut regions of the genome down forever by making it hyper-compacted, those are the ones that really drive cell identity. So for example, when our brains are developing, when we're in the womb, our brain cells never need to carry oxygen around in the blood. So they turn off all the genes that code for the proteins that carry oxygen around in the blood, and they'll do it using this mechanism. So it's an extraordinary system. So again, the phrase epigenetic, these are all called epigenetic modifications, again from the Greek, meaning they're on or in addition to the DNA code. They're small modifications to DNA and histone proteins. <coughs> modifications to DNA are almost always the same chemical modification. The modifications to histone proteins, there's like 60 different modifications you can have, and there's all sorts of crosstalk. So the histone modifications are very subtle in their effects. They never change what a gene codes for. So you can get the, all these modifications put on, but the gene will still code for the same protein, but it will just change the level of expression of the gene. So you don't get any change in what the gene is producing. What's the impact of these epigenetic modifications? Well, one of the things that's really important is they're passed on during cell division. So this is why when skin, a skin cell divides and gives rise to two more skin cells, that's why they're both skin cells, the daughter cells, because they don't just get the DNA from the parent cell, they get some of the epigenetic modifications, the ones that define this is a skin cell. Some of them are transient. They represent very short-term responses to the environment. Some of them last a lifetime, like the ones in our brain that switch off the hemoglobin genes. So they're very variable in their timing. And they are, as I mentioned, the link between nature and nurture. They're how the environment is able to have long-term conversations with our genes. And they're hugely important. There are proteins that will add epigenetic modifications to genes. These are called writers. There are proteins that will take epigenetic modifications off, like when the green jelly tots were replaced by the purple ones. Those are called erasers. And there are also proteins that can bind to the different flavors of modification and can change how, ex how gene expression is affected. So it's a really, really beautiful, <coughs> subtle system. And it's a subtle system that has fantastic consequences. So these are epigenetic consequences. These are my favorite mice of all time. They are called the agouti viable yellow mice. The one on the left is golden and fat. And the one on the right is skinny and brown. And they are genetically absolutely identical to each other. And they've been given the same food completely the same as each other. And actually, in a litter, you can get every gradation in between. So you get like a color scale and an obesity scale of these mice. I've just gone for the extremes here. They're amazing. The reason they're so different has nothing to do with DNA. Their DNA is the same. All that's happened is that they have 
different epigenetic modifications at just one point in their genome, just one little region. And because of this, we can do really interesting experiments with them. They're not my experiments. They're a woman called Emma Whitehall, who's fantastic. She worked on these mice, and she knew, as did other people, that when the fat yellow females breed, they usually have quite a lot of fat yellow offspring. When the skinny brown females breed, they tend to have quite a lot of skinny brown offspring. <coughs> the ratios were very stable, so any skinny brown mouse would have a particular percentage of skinny brown offspring. And any fat yellow mice would have a particular percentage of fat yellow offspring. So she did this really interesting experiment with them, and I've met Emma a few times, and I've always forgotten to ask her why she did this. <coughs> I don't know what inspires someone to say, do you know what, I think I'll give those mice alcohol and see what happens. <laughs> I have absolutely no clue. Um, I've shown this as Prosecco, but Emma's Australian, so it was probably a nice Shiraz or something. Um, so, gave the female mice alcohol. The most extraordinary thing happened the fat yellow mice had a smaller percentage of fat yellow offspring than normal. And the skinny brown mice had a bigger percentage of unusual offspring than normal. The alcohol intake of the mother affected the phenotype of her children. And that was true even if she was given the alcohol before she was pregnant. Really, really bizarre. Now, I worked in drug discovery for uh, about 13 years, and um, we weren't that interested in drunk mice, although it would have livened up quite a few of the parties I've to. Um, what we were interested in was creating new drugs for human disease. And we think epigenetics is really important in this. We think epigenetics plays a major role in many human diseases. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Um, but why would we think that? Well, the reason is because a huge number of human diseases, particularly the ones that affect us later in life, there is nothing wrong with our genes. We've been absolutely fine with our genes for 50, 60 years. And then something goes wrong. And it stays wrong. And the way that I think of it is it being a bit like a bicycle. So imagine, this is Cambridge after all, imagine you have a bicycle. Right? Gorgeous bicycle. And you go down to the street to ride your bicycle, but you can't because somebody has chained it to a bike stand and you don't have a key to the lock. There's nothing wrong with your bicycle. You just don't have a key to the lock. If you could unlock that bicycle, you could ride it away because your bike's in fabulous condition. The hypothesis is that that's what's happening in lots of human conditions, chronic conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and possibly type 2 diabetes. The idea is that there's nothing wrong with the genes. Our genes are like the bicycle. They're completely normal, completely fine. What's happened is they've got locked in the wrong patterns of expression. And if we could just unlock those patterns of expression, we might be able to reverse the problems in ourselves and reverse the disease. <coughs> And the best way that we know that genes get locked in the wrong patterns of expression is by having the wrong epigenetic modifications on them. And we do have some data suggesting this may be true. So there are two types of cancer which are now treated really quite successfully with drugs that inhibit the writers, the enzymes that put epigenetic modifications onto genes. They're working really successfully, but we don't know why they work. So one of them works in a condition called myelodysplastic syndrome, and the other one works in a condition called cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. They work really well at holding back the cancer. We also know that about 15% of cancers, any cancer, the epigenetic signatures in the cancer cell have gone completely bananas. But those first drugs, the ones that treat myelodysplastic syndrome and cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, we developed by accident. Um, far more happens by accident in drug discovery than people let on. Um, now, scientists in the pharmaceutical and biotech companies are trying to use basic knowledge about epigenetics to design new drugs. So 
the top one is a drug that inhibits a particular protein that puts on histone modifications. And we know that that protein is specifically mutated in certain types of cancer. Um, <clears throat> the bottom drug, which is in phase three trials, that inhibits one of the readers. So it means that where the epigenetics has possibly gone wrong, you interfere with it by stopping the reader holding <coughs> and causing the wrong chain effect. <coughs> so we're really excited about the potential of this for human disease. We also view this as a new way of thinking about why a good start in life is so important for babies. We always say this, we always say it's really important, maternal health is really important for the health of the fetus and the baby. And actually, often we don't know why. This is all done epidemiologically. We know that it's not good for a child if they're being carried, yeah, sorry, we know that if a mother is obese <coughs> while she's pregnant, that that can have bad consequences for her offspring. We know the same is true of smoking, we know the same is true of alcohol. We often don't know why. But one thing that seems to be quite apparent is that actually the first hundred days in utero are vitally important. And what we think is happening is that patterns of gene expression become established when the baby is developing very early in the first trimester. And those patterns of gene expression become set, and they probably become set by epigenetic modifications. And once they're set, it's really difficult to reverse them. Um, so a classic example is that if the um, mother is very malnourished during the first stages of pregnancy, there are data from a particular period in history suggesting that her offspring will be more prone to become obese when they're older. And what's probably happened is that the, their genetic expression levels have been set to make the most of any nutrients coming into the system. Because the fetus has been basically developed during a period of famine. But if when that fetus grows up to be an adult, there's loads of food around, their metabolic system can't adapt. Their metabolic system is still trying to grab as much nutrition as possible. So it's a really, really odd phenomenon. But epigenetics is a really good hypothesis for fetal origins of adult disease. I'm going to take you back to something weird now, because I like the weird stuff. There is something very peculiar about mammals. Right? These creatures are fabulous. There's a stick insect, there's a zebrafish, gorgeous salamander, beautiful Komodo dragon, I love Komodo dragons. And there's a zebra finch. So that kind of covers the major bits of the complex animal kingdom, apart from mammals. All those species, including very controversially the zebra finch, have done something that no mammal has ever done. Do you know what it is? What was that? Change sex. Change sex? No. Um, that's a good one, but it's not right. <coughs> Although um, certainly certain fish change sex, and that is totally an epigenetic phenomenon. Another guess? Develop from eggs. Sorry? Develop from eggs. Develop from eggs. Not quite right, but you're getting nearer. It is to do with reproduction. Asexual? Yes, great. Both of you at the same time. Each of these species, including controversially the zebra finch, has shown parthenogenesis. That is, that a female who has never mated with a male has actually managed to produce young. Mammals don't do that. Mammals have never done that. And it's one of those wonderful things where we just go, mammals don't do that. Mammals can't do that. And we all just take it for granted. Back in the 1980s, Azim Sarani, who was a professor at the Gurdon Institute, decided it was time we stopped taking it for granted and worked out what was actually happening. Azim Sarani did his PhD with Bob Edwards, one of the fathers of in vitro fertilization, who got the Nobel Prize a few years ago. Um, and actually, it is a mystery to everybody why Azim Sarani has not got the Nobel Prize for this work, because it was absolutely <coughs> transformational. He used the techniques of in vitro fertilization, but he used mice. And he did this beautifully elegant experiment. He took a fertilized mouse egg, 
and he took out the nucleus. And then he injected it in two mouse egg nuclei. And they fused, and he implanted that egg into a female mouse, and development started, and then it went haywire. <coughs> no live young were born. <coughs> then he did exactly the same experiment, but once he'd taken the nucleus out of the egg, he put in two mouse sperm nuclei, and they fused, and he implanted that back into a mouse, and development began, no live young. Development went haywire. And then he did the experiment again, this time an egg nucleus and a sperm nucleus. They fused, he put it back in, he put that into a female, and as we would all expect, only it's lost it, and Apple Max. <laughs> it's usually a cute picture of a mouse there. <laughs> No mice. Egg and sperm nucleus, mice. The beautiful, beautiful thing about the Zeme's work is he set the experiments up in such a way that those three scenarios were exactly the same genetically. There was no difference in terms of DNA between two egg nuclei, two sperm nuclei, or the egg and the sperm. But only when you had the egg and the sperm could you get live young. And that showed us that mammalian reproduction does not depend solely on having the right DNA. There is something else as well. It showed us that mammalian reproduction is completely an epigenetic phenomenon. And what he showed as well was that the basis of this phenomenon was DNA methylation, DNA modifications, those yellow jelly tops that I told you about. Certain regions of the human genome, or all mammalian genomes actually, certain regions of all mammal genomes, when they're passed on in an egg or a sperm, they are passed on with DNA modifications in certain bits of the genome. And these basically specify, I'm from mum or I'm from dad, depending on that pattern of modifications. And it is vital, not one of us would be here without it. No mammal would be here without it. It is absolutely vital. Sometimes it goes wrong. Um, the little girl on the left has a condition called Angelman syndrome. She is very underweight, she will fail to thrive, and she has a severe educational disability. The boy on the right has something called prada willi syndrome. He will be chronically obese, morbidly obese his entire life. He also has severe educational disability. Um, if any of you are familiar with the reality star, Jordan, her, uh, her son Harvey, that's what he suffers from, Carla Willie syndrome. Children with both of these conditions, their DNA is absolutely fine, totally fine. What's gone wrong is the epigenetic information that was passed on, just at one point in their genome. So that this little girl, Instead of at one point in her genome having an epigenetic modification on one copy from her mum that said I'm from mum and one copy from her dad that said I'm from dad, has two copies that her cells think both came from her dad. Mum. Mum. Sorry. <coughs> Could be dad, can't remember. Um, <laughs> this boy, I can remember if I work it out, but I'm so intimidated by the fact there's all this fancy physics stuff I can't bring myself to write on the um, This boy, he has the opposite scenario. So instead of two copies that look like they're from his mum, his cells think he has two copies from his dad. The weird thing is it's exactly the same region of the genome. So you get these what are almost reciprocal phenotypes. Obesity versus severely underweight. That's just because one bit of epigenetic information from parent to child was passed on wrongly. Now, all these things I've been telling you might sound a bit random, but actually they're all related. And they're related because I think they allow us to generate a really interesting hypothesis. Epigenetic information is passed on from parent to child. We absolutely know that. The mammalian reproduction is entirely dependent on it. 
That's what Azim Sarani's data showed us, for example, where we didn't get the mice unless we had the eggs and the sperm. Epigenetic information can be influenced by the environment. I told you that about the alcohol, uh, about the alcohol situation, and I showed you that in the mice, whose phenotype is determined by epigenetics, and where that could be changed by alcohol. So, parents pass on epigenetic information to their children, and epigenetic information is, can be altered by the environment. That seems to me to lead to a perfectly sensible hypothesis. And that hypothesis is that we can pass on epigenetic responses to the environment to <coughs> our offspring. That's a hypothesis. It's not an unreasonable one, given those two horizontal arrows. Of course, there is a slight issue with this hypothesis. Who's the bloke with the sideburns? Lamarck. That hypothesis is essentially the inheritance of acquired characteristics. That's Lamarckism. And that doesn't happen. In fact, worse, that can't happen. Whenever somebody says to me, that can't happen, I always get a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> always. I don't think we should be using expressions like that. But let's just remind ourselves. Lamarck, we tend to have this really sniffy attitude to Lamarck, but actually we should remember that he was trying to make a perfectly sensible approach to the question of why we have different species. And his theory was that the ancestor of the giraffe, for example, wandering around on the plains and the savannas, and would see a tree with nice lush leaves and would stretch its head and its neck to reach the lush leaves. And just like if you go to the gym and you actually use the weights, you will get the answers. <laughs> um, if an animal does that, keeps stretching its neck, it might get a slightly longer neck. And what the mark posited was that that animal would then pass on its response to the environment to its offspring, it would pass on a <coughs> And of course, now that is not the model we use at all. Our model now is the Darwinian model combined with the Mendelian model, which is that some ancestors of the giraffes had naturally slightly longer necks. That gave them an advantage. They were more likely to produce a larger number of offspring. Their offspring would inherit the genetic information that gave them the longer necks, and on and on it would go. And I for, don't for a second want you to come away thinking that I'm saying Darwin was wrong. Big fan of Darwin, love Darwin, awesome stuff, right? Almost all the time the Darwinian model is right. Just once in a while, the mark may have got it right. Um, incidentally, if you're on Twitter and you're bored, just say something like that and hashtag Richard Dawkins. <laughs> he doesn't respond, but all his fanboys come piling in like you've just eaten someone's baby. It's <laughs> Anyway, it's heresy. But, it's not that ridiculous an idea now that we understand about epigenetics. And Apple, again, for some reason, has replaced my little cartoon of a mouse in the next one, which is a shame. <coughs> On the left, I have a nice picture of a mouse. The reason is because lots of people have been trying to see if we can really show that parents can pass their environmental responses onto their offspring. And this is one of the coolest, weirdest experiments ever. The scientists took mice um, and they used genetically inbred mice so that they could control for genetic variation. And they exposed the mice to the smell of cherry blossom. I know that's actually a picture of a cherry, it was just a nicer picture. Okay, but they exposed <coughs> the mice to the smell of cherry blossom and gave them an electric shock. And they did this multiple times. <coughs> and of course, it's a classic conditioning experiment. The mice learn to associate the smell of cherry blossom with an electric shock, with something bad happened. And quite soon, <coughs> the mice get to a stage where just smelling cherry blossom is enough to make them shake with fear, as I suspect I would too in their circumstances. Okay? So, conditioned mice. They were, they were allowed to breed. Um, they used male mice in this. And then they looked at the next generation, the F1. And again, I've lost my cute little mouse. But basically, they took the offspring and they exposed them to the smell of cherry blossom. They never gave them an electric shock. And when they did this, the offspring shook with fear. That is so bizarre. It's so 
so bizarre, I ended up talking about it on Radio 4 with John Humphreys asking me impossible to answer questions <laughs> and the that we were talking about. It was great. Okay. It's one of the most bizarre experiments ever. It's a beautifully designed experiment. It was beautifully designed because they'd controlled the genetics of the animals, but it was also beautifully designed because they knew what to look for. You see, if you think about our DNA, three billion base pairs, you don't want to have to go all the way along that, looking for strange epigenetic changes in the parent and the offspring. That's an awful lot of work. But the experimenters doing these experiments knew exactly which gene to look at, because they knew the gene that gets switched on to detect cherry blossom. They also knew exactly which neurons in the brain to look at. And so they were able to look very precisely for the epigenetic changes. And what they found was that when the First generation was exposed to the smell of cherry blossom. They got epigenetic changes of this specific gene in the specific region of the brain. And those same changes were reproduced in their offspring. We have no idea how, but they were reproduced. It's an extraordinary experiment. Um, probably needs to be repeated by other labs because then we have more confidence, but there is actually a bit of a warning note on some of these. You have to be really careful how you do these intergenerational experiments. And this is my favorite example of one that went wrong. So mice, mice unfortunately have a bit of a hard time with their genetics. These experiments, as they took a male mouse and they traumatized him. And the way you traumatize a mouse is by taking a small mouse and leaving it in a cage with a big mouse. Okay? A mouse is a coward. If it's outgunned, it will run away. But these mice were trapped in the cages of the big aggressive mice and they couldn't run away. And very quickly, the male mouse, the little one, stopped eating properly, stopped grooming properly. It became this really, really pitiful specimen of mousedom. And then one day, mouse has its lucky day. <laughs> Investigators pick up the mouse, put it into a cage with a receptive female, and it mated. And all its offspring were runty, they were underweight. And the interpretation was that the male had epigenetically transmitted his trauma. Another group of experimenters looked at this and went, mm, not so sure. They did the same thing, they used the same strain of mice, put the mouse in a cage with a bigger mouse, traumatized it. And then, do you remember I said lucky day? It got lifted out, mated with a female, not such lucky day. It got lifted out, and the investigators got his semen. I don't even want to think about how you do that. <laughs> I don't even think about what you say when you go home and somebody from your partner says, did you have a good life today? <laughs> what did you do? Anyway. <laughs> then they artificially inseminated the female. Exactly the same environmental situation, exactly the same genetic situation. But when she didn't see the runty little mouse, and she was just inseminated with semen, all her offspring were a perfectly normal weight. <laughs> it wasn't that the male had transmitted his trauma. What had happened was that the female had seen this pitiful little specimen of mouse coming towards her and thought, oh well, if I must. <laughs> I controlled the amount of nutrition for the litter. Nobody knows how. Um, if you're struggling to visualize what that situation would be like, I can put it for you in human terms, okay? It's like, I ordered George Clooney, they sent Danny DeVito. <laughs> so we have no idea how she restricted the supply of nutrients to her offspring, but she did. You have to be so careful when you do these epigenetic experiments because the confounding variables can be huge. And actually, this whole field, as you might imagine, of transmission of, through the generations is hugely, hugely controversial. And I think, it, however, it is becoming unreasonable to say it doesn't happen. Work in rats with odd nutrition, again, in Cambridge, <coughs> and folks like a fabulous professor at the physiology department, has again shown that you get these big intergenerational effects. And within the last year, um, a paper was published in Science using not mice, but this tiny little worm, C. elegans, which is a fabulous experimental system. This has absolutely shown that in that system, 
Epigenetic information and epigenetic responses can be passed on for at least 14 generations. <coughs> this is happening. <coughs> it's not an alternative to the Darwinian Mendelian model. It is an add-on. It is something different that happens. Why are we so resistant to it? Well, we're resistant to it because I believe, as biologists, we're extremely poorly trained. We're very well trained in how to do experiments. We are very poorly trained in how to interpret them and how to understand our own discipline. So we always think the first thing we discovered must be the most important thing. <coughs> so the first modifications that were discovered to histones, for example, are something called acetylation. A few years ago, somebody published that there was a form of histone modification called crotonylation. I don't even know what that is, okay? But for all I know, crotonylation may turn out to be more important than acetylation in cells, but everyone still works on acetylation because it's what we identified first. When we don't know what something does, we assume that it does nothing in biology. It's fascinating. We don't even say no known function. Okay? Um, I showed you on my marshmallow versions, I showed you the DNA wrapped around eight histone proteins, then the DNA carrying on, and then another eight histone proteins. Actually, there's one single protein that's in between the two, sits there on that empty stretch of DNA. We're now realizing it's incredibly important, but for years we didn't know what it did, so we said it didn't do anything. Ludicrous. Um, we argue about terms instead of biology. Everybody's arguing about their favorite definition of epigenetics, instead of arguing about what the actual biology is. We focus on pathways instead of networks. We train all our students that A goes to B goes to C goes to D. And it kind of does, but there's an awful lot else that's happening all at the same time, but that's very difficult to get our heads around. So we don't train about the networks, we train about the pathways, but then we forget that the networks exist. Um, we put our cells and our systems into little boxes, and then we expect cells to behave the same way. So there is this hugely irritating debate going on at the moment, which is one group of scientists saying epigenetics is the key, another group of scientists saying transcription factors are the key, <coughs> another group of scientists saying non-coding RNA is the key. If you mess up any of those, the cells go wrong. There is no start, there is no end. They all are interconnected. And we have to stop expecting complex systems to behave the way that we want them to behave in classification. And we also say this can't happen. And I do think that phrase of this can't happen because it's wrong, because it doesn't fit the model, is a really dangerous one. Um, so, things to remember, genetics and epigenetics always work together. The genetic sequence that you have will influence the epigenetic modifications that were to be established at that point, but it also goes the other way around. Um, the classic one that you all know, association does not imply causation. Um, I was asked to review a paper where a cosmetics manufacturer was claiming that they added their particular component to cell, skin cells in culture, and they saw an epigenetic change, and therefore their component worked through epigenetics because there was an epigenetic change. And I was explaining to the person who'd asked me to review it, there was an epigenetic change, it does not mean anything to you, um, that you could sprinkle on cheese and onion crisps, and you would find an epigenetic change. Um, as we all know, one of the biggest risk factors for lung cancer is carrying a box of matches in your pocket. Okay. Not causation. Um, almost everything will have an epigenetic effect if we look hard enough, because the epigenetic system is incredibly dynamic. Just because it has an effect doesn't really mean it's doing it. Even if it's statistically significant. You can find something that's statistically significant, but in the great, wonderful mass of what we are, it really doesn't matter that much. So when people start going, oh my God, what am I doing to my epigenetics? It's like, calm down, calm down. Same thing as you were doing before you ever heard the word epigenetics. It's all okay. Um, most effects, particularly in humans, will be subtle and lost in the background. We are a highly outbred species with extraordinarily complex environments. So most of the time, we don't need to worry. Um, and we don't need to worry about the transgenerational thing most of the time. I have had to explain to people that, no, you cannot say, I am 28 stone because granddad ate a donut. <laughs> um, but I do think it's quite right that if we are putting forward a revolutionary concept that the burden of proof should be very high. So I think it's absolutely right that this intergenerational stuff receives a lot of scrutiny. There is so much more I can tell you about because epigenetics is involved in loads of things. Um, 
Identical twins are genetically identical. They become less identical phenotypically as they age. <coughs> their genetics really doesn't change, but their epigenomes change spectacularly, spectacularly as they age. And epigenetics may be the reason why, say, one twin will have schizophrenia and the other will be healthy. Um, plants, epigenetics plays a huge role in plants. Um, it's why things like winter barley have to be planted in the winter. The seeds need a period of cold or the plant won't flower. Absolutely epigenetics. The intergenerational stuff is completely accepted by the plant people. They've known about it for ages and they can't understand why we animal people are so exercised about it. They think we're very behind the times. Epigenetics plays a role in aging, probably not the most important factor, but it is important. Tortoise shell cats. Does anyone here have a tortoise shell cat or ever had one? Female cat? Female. Female, female. cat? Yeah, they're almost always female. Um, female mammals, we are even more exciting epigenetically than the men. Um, we have two X chromosomes and we turn one of them off. And we do it completely through epigenetics. It's absolutely covered in epigenetic modifications that turn it off. Um, and a tortoiseshell cat, that's why a tortoiseshell cat has that pattern. Um, on the black side of its face, it's turned off the orange fur gene on its X chromosome. On the other side of its face, it's turned off the black one. So their epigenetic masterpiece is even more than usual. Um, Dolly the sheep. That's Dolly the sheep, the most famous sheep in the world, the cone sheep. Um, I have to point out, I always have to point out, that Dolly is dead in this photo. <laughs> <laughs> that a bunch of students actually thought she was just so famous that she was the real world. <laughs> 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 being taken to a case at the Royal Scottish Museum. <coughs> if we didn't have epigenetic systems in our bodies, cloning would not work. But it's because we have epigenetic systems that cloning is often inefficient and often the offspring are not as healthy, the cloned animals are not as healthy as the originator. Honeybees, honeybees are awesome. Um, and Again, if I took DNA from a queen and a worker, I wouldn't be able to tell you which had come from the queen and which had come from the worker, because genetically there is nothing to distinguish them. The queens, are develop, uh, the queens develop when they are fed royal jelly for longer. Queens and workers are absolutely phenotypically different, and epigenetics plays a substantial role in maintaining that phenotypic difference. To give you an idea of how phenotypically different they are, a queen will live 20 times as long as a worker. If you put that into human terms, we are only halfway through the reign of Queen Elizabeth, the first. Okay? It's a huge phenotypic difference, and epigenetics plays a significant role in that. And I would love to tell you about all of this, but I'm kind of out of time, but you don't have to despair, because if you wanted to, you could always buy my books. <laughs> <laughs> so with that shameless plug, thank you very much. That was absolutely riveting, thank you. I suspect there may be one or two questions. I'll try and be fair, I'm, I'm in a fair mood this evening. So first come, first serve. Uh, try and catch my eye. Lady at the front yeah. here, please. Um, in the applications in cancer, to what extent can epigenetic solutions actually reverse the effects of cancer or get rid of it, rather than just keep it in the So at the moment, so the question. Absolutely, so the question was in terms of using epigenetic drugs to treat cancer, to what extent will they actually reverse the cancer phenotype, and to what extent will they just keep the cancer under control? The existing drugs, the ones that are already licensed for use in humans, what they do is they keep it under control. Once you stop treating the patients, the cancer develops again, so they're acting as a break. We're not quite sure about the next set that are coming through. Um, and it's important to remember that there is no such thing as a cancer which is only a cancer for one reason. So often what you will also find in cancers is that certain key genes have mutated within the cancer and you've got this complex network of epigenetic and genetic genes. <coughs> so at the moment we don't know if there will be curative or not. Something to bear in mind is I think that what we will see in cancer treatments in the future is we will see two completely different strands. One will be the amazingly expensive immunotherapies, which are costing a huge amount of money, but which do actually cure certain cancers. 
I suspect what we're going to see with other types of cancer is that we change cancer from a condition that you die from to a condition that you live with. So it will be like HIV. Nobody has been cured of HIV, um, really, except in a couple of recent clinical trials. We've just turned HIV into something you can live with. And I think that's what we're going to see more and more in cancer. <coughs> There. Next, I'm going to let you choose who you oh, like. Okay. I've got time to do this and get in trouble. <laughs> <coughs> Thanks. Um, in your view, what's the most biologically plausible mechanism to explain the vertical transmission of these epigenetic changes, like the, um, the cherry blossom mice? Nice. I think the cherry blossom one's unbelievably difficult to explain. Um, it, it's incredible to. I have no clue. Nobody has a clue how the cherry blossom one works. And one of the big problems that we have at the moment is. Throughout this field, if we don't know how it works, we say it doesn't happen, um, which I think is a huge mistake. I think the cherry blossom one is going to be the most complicated one of all to sort out. With the ones which are based on nutrition, so the kind of work that Anne Ferguson Smith is doing, um, we thought we would know. <coughs> Anne was very confident about it, everyone else was confident about it. They assumed that it would be in this hundred or so regions of the genome where information is passed on. So you know I said there are about 100 spots where you pass on information saying I'm from mum and I'm from dad. The assumption was that when you had weird nutritional effects going down through the generations, that the changes would have been passed on in these regions. And there were two reasons for thinking that. One was that those regions we know epigenetic information is passed on, so they seemed like a really sensible starting point. And the other reason was because almost all of those hundred re regions of the genome, they are to do with controlling the flow of nutrition to the offspring. <coughs> and they sequenced them, and there were no changes whatsoever. They sequenced the genetics, and there were no changes. So we actually don't know. And that's the great thing about giving a talk about epigenetics, is I can come out with loads of stuff, I can hypothesize, and then I go, actually, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> One of the missing links in epigenetics is we don't know why modifications only get changed at certain points in the genome. And we now think this has to do with um, what we used to call junk DNA. And it could be that what's happening is in the zygote, in that cell that's fused by, uh, formed by the fusion of the egg and the sperm, you not only have epigenetic information being transmitted, but you have things like long non-coding RNAs, junk RNA also transmitting, which is then generating the next set of changes. And although it seems extraordinary, and it is extraordinary, to think, well, could that really re-establish gene expression patterns in the brain? Well, I suppose another way of thinking of it is that's what happens all the time. That's how you end up with the brain, <laughs> you know, is that you start with this little amorphous cell, and eventually you end up with a fully functioning brain. And it, basically, we have huge gaps in our knowledge. There's always been a very strong crossover between <coughs> developmental biology and um, epigenetics. That, that's where the two fields have converged, and that's why Cambridge is so strong, because it's always been so brilliant at developmental biology. Um, but yeah, we, we don't know. But then we don't know why you end up with a proper brain anyway. That's a very nice talk about epigenetics. The first time I actually understood anything about it, I had several people try to explain it to me. But at one stage you slipped into said, I thought you described your jelly tops as methylation. Now, now I've heard methylation. Yeah, sorry, I but then you talked about acetylation. Now I'm quite confused. Right, so DNA, sorry, my bad. DNA, the DNA <coughs> bit, 99.9999% of any modification put on DNA is methylation. So it's one carbon, three hydrogens. And it pretty much, almost all the time, has the same effect, which is to shut down gene expression. <coughs> on the histones, it's hugely more complicated. So a very common modification on histones is acetylation. That switches gene expression on. So that would have been like the green gel choice. The trouble is on histones, <coughs> excuse me, you can also get methylation. Some methylation on histones switches genes on, some switches it off. And then there's also at least 60 other different chemical groups that can be added. And they can be added in all sorts of combinations. So you rapidly get to a stage where it's really difficult to predict <coughs> what will happen if you get this complex um, set of modifications. Because you don't have to have, if you've got those eight histone proteins, they don't all have to have the same modifications or the same positions. Um, so yes, DNA, it's always methylation. Histones, it's just loads of different things. They're, like, they're just like they're decorated with the most ludicrous set of Christmas tree lights in the world.
and we find it really difficult to interpret that. Uh, over there? Yeah, I'll come back here. Um, yep. The little mouse that suffers the electric shock, um, does the same effect obtain if you don't use smell, but touch, sound, taste? And what different <coughs> smells? That are. Uh, None of that has been done apart from the different smells in the sense that what the experimenters did was to show that um, the parent mouse, if you, ex if you gave it the shock with the smell of cherry blossom, then you got this response. Um, and if you then exposed the offspring to the smell of cherry blossom, they shook with fear. They didn't shake with fear in response to other strong smells. So it was very, very specific, <coughs> excuse me, to that particular smell. Um, but it hasn't been tried with other stimuli, as far as I know. They're horribly complex experiments to do. Epigenomics have any effect on Down syndrome? Okay. Uh, not that we know of. Um, and in Down syndrome, because you have that entire duplication of chromosome, I think the ability of the epigenetic system to compensate for that is it, it, it surpasses what the epigenetic system could do. Um, where we do think epigenetics plays a role is in um, some of the multifactorial systems. So if you think of something like schizophrenia, I mentioned one twin may have schizophrenia, another may not. And <clears throat> any complex disorder like that where identical twins don't come down with the same condition. And there is one bit where epigenetics actually influences people who have a disorder so that they don't have the disorder anymore. So we've always had this puzzle that we have single gene disorders where a mutation is enough to give you a phenotype. Um, and we always had, actually, we always had a couple of puzzles with that. So you'd have this condition, particularly if it was one where, so you inherit a copy from your mum and a copy from your dad. In a dominant disorder, only one of those needs to be wrong, and you have the disease. So those are called dominant disorders, but <coughs> excuse me, we've always had this really strange phenomenon where we knew that there were people who had the mutation, but they weren't as badly affected, or they weren't affected at all. And again, we did that thing of coming up with fancy terms. So we said these were examples of variable penetrance, which might <coughs> mean of 100 people who have the disorder, only 95 have the symptoms. <coughs> Or we'd say it was variable expressivity, which is 100 people have the symptoms, but they're all very different. And again, those expressions meant nothing whatsoever. What we think now is that sometimes the variable penetrance will be because on, say, the mutated gene, the mutated version of the gene, it may have been switched off epigenetically. Um, but there's also the example of people with um, hemoglobinopathies. So you have two copies of each of the hemoglobin genes. And there are people um, who, so when, when you have one of those problems, you're fine when you're in the womb. You're getting oxygen from your mother. And when you're in the womb, you express a particular type of hemoglobin in your blood called fetal hemoglobin. And then when you're born, that gene gets switched off and you switch to the adult version of hemoglobin. And if your adult version of hemoglobin has a mutation in it, you then develop the symptoms. But there are some people who, when they're born, they never switch off the fetal gene. Because the epigenetic system that should switch off the fetal gene misfires. And actually, they are protected epigenetically from the hemoglobinopathy, because they never make the switch in gene expression. So we do have situations where we know the epigenetic system can change the effects of a genetic condition, but not in Down syndrome. Do we know whether the immune system interacts with epigenetics to de-express um, otherwise pathological conditions? We don't, but I think it's almost inevitable. <coughs> so if we think about so many of the chronic disorders, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, rheumatoid arthritis, so many of the conditions that we see in later life in particular have a strong inflammatory component. It would make sense that the epigenetics may be involved, but we have no actual data. Um, everyone's trying to generate the data, but it's really difficult to do. I'm talking about that on my field here, but uh, my understanding was before um, a 
piece of DNA could uh, replicate. It had to linearize itself and unwind. But don't these bits of protein drop out when that happens? So, great question. <laughs> if we think about the DNA methylation, when the, so the DNA methylation, the two strands separate, right? And you make a new copy of each strand of DNA. There is a really well understood mechanism in our cells so that when the two strands separate and say they're methylated, the strand that is then built as the new one, an enzyme comes along and can recognize that there was met there's methylation on one of the strands and it should put methylation on the other strand. So methylation, we abs DNA methylation, we absolutely understand how that is passed on from parent cell to daughter cell. The puzzle is with the histone proteins. Because you're absolutely right, the DNA unwinds from around them. It winds up pretty quickly again back around them. But you basically, if you had a million histone proteins, let's say it's a random number in the parent cell, there needs to be a million in each of the daughter cells. And we've no idea how the daughter cells re-establish the right patterns of histone modifications. <coughs> and sometimes they probably don't. And that's probably what causes this phenomenon known as epigenetic drift where cells get less and less similar. And that's probably one of the factors that contributes to development of chronic disease as they become epigenetically abnormal. But you'll notice I'm using the word probably a lot. We don't really know. And it's that whole issue about how the histone modifications get passed on is one of the critical ones in epigenetics. So my question is about obesity in women. Mm -hmm. Obese mothers tend to produce obese children for epigenetic reasons. Now, associated with that is type 2 diabetes, various cancers and so forth. Is there evidence, my question is, is there evidence of a not a normal, popula not a normal distribution of a population, but a population with two peaks? Hmm. So. The question is around obese mothers <coughs> having obese children and the role of epigenetics in that and whether we end up with very differentiated populations. Um, it's very true that obese mothers have obese children. It's not necessarily clear, and in fact it probably isn't, that probably doesn't happen through epigenetics. It's almost certainly that the offspring are getting too much nutrition across the placenta because there's just so much sugar, for example, surging around in the mother's bloodstream. The, the epigenetics of those obese children will be abnormal compared with children of healthy weight, but we don't know the extent to which that continues to drive their obesity, or whether or not the um, epigenetics in that circumstance is because they are obese in the first place. It's very difficult to unravel cause and effect in these. This is one of the reasons as well why all those experiments on generational transmission they're all, they're all done through the male of the species, apart from the one I showed you with the alcohol and the acute mice. Now, all experimenters use males because that way you get around all the effects of intrauterine confounding factors. So it's just, it's just hideously complicated. So we do everything through the male line now. Just two more questions, I'm afraid. Yes, okay. I'm, I'm called time on the other yeah. side. <laughs> I want to ask a question about the scenario if, uh, when you described uh, the, the fat yellow mouse and also the brown small mm -hmm. mouse. Um, so uh, so uh, you mentioned that when alcohol was given to to the mouse uh, uh, when it was pregnant, uh, it reduces the, the amount of uh, mouse um, um, that, that will have the same uh, same appearance as yeah. as the parents. Um, and you also mentioned that um, when the alcohol uh, um, uh, um, uh, the reduction in the number of mouse uh, that has the same appearance with the parents, um, uh, this uh, phenomenon also happens when um, when the alcohol is given to the parents uh, before it was it was pregnant. So um, I I want to ask how what was the what's the duration of time um, be, be between uh, the time when the alcohol is yeah. given to 
different to the parents and um, the time when the um, when the mouse is um, made to yeah. reproduce this. No, it's a really good question. Um, it's one to which I have no idea about the answer. Um, <laughs> normally when I have no idea about the answer, I try and answer a different question and pretend it's the same one you just asked. Uh, I'm not going to get away with that because you phrased it so well. Um, I can check Emma's paper and I can find out what the duration was. But what she didn't do was to do a whole series of experiments to see how far back she could do that. So she hasn't done a temporal timeline. We don't know with those mice whether what's happening is the alcohol is inducing a change to the uterine environment, which is maintained <coughs> when the mouse becomes pregnant, or if there's some changes in the epigenome, epigenome in the eggs. And at the time when those experiments were done, the technology wasn't advanced enough to allow, to allow analysis of individual eggs very cleanly. Um, so we don't, we don't know what, quite what that effect is in the mothers. Um, but it's a really good question. Actually, they, although I say we don't know yet, they couldn't do the work in the individual eggs. What they were able to show was that in the offspring, there was perfect correlation between the phenotype and the DNA modification. So in these mice, we know that there had been a change in the DNA methylation in the offspring, but we don't know if that's because the eggs changed, or whether the uterine environment changed, or something else changed. Yeah, um, so there was no way of analyzing it. It's only really recently that um, technology has become good enough that we can analyze a single egg and work that out. We say, I say we, it's not me, it's all I have done. Yeah, but first, uh, I also just wondered if the alcohol had to be uh, present once um, uh, to cost the, the, the alcohol had cleared the system before conception <coughs> when she used the um, preconception model. So it wasn't that there was still alcohol in the mother's system. So that's the only bit I do know. Thank you. So, Last one. Over there. Just got a question. I remember a piece of research from a few years ago about or linking. Um, schizophrenia, or the likelihood of schizophrenia in children to the age of the father, uh -huh. and it was claiming genetic changes yes. somehow. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that it was more likely to be epigenetic? Um, I think you can toss a coin and take a chance. Um, <laughs> I don't think anybody knows. Um, th there's huge differences between the male and the female epigenetically in terms of what's likely to transmit, in that with the females, you make our eggs really, really early. And, you know, we, we, if we're, when you're in utero, you've already produced the eggs, and they've already gone through the first biotic division. Males produce sperm all the time. And so you could argue that females are more likely to accumulate epigenetic changes in their eggs, because the eggs are sitting there for a long time. Or you could claim that males are more likely to accumulate epigenetic modifications in their sperm, because they're constantly making large amounts of sperm, and the epigenetic system will never be perfect. So, that's a really great, I don't know on which to make. <laughs> <laughs>